To be a modern socialist country in 2049, prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious and beautiful, and ambitious goal set by the Communist Party of China. What is the essence of this goal? What does each term foreshadow? What impact will it all have on the world? Institutions, development models, multiple risks. What are the long-term challenges? And what about unexpected events or sudden problems? How to deal with uncertainty, especially over three decades? There are no easy answers, but the questions are vital. Watch our special series on Closer to China, China 2049, Opportunities and Challenges. After four decades of historic development, China's economy must transition from high rate of growth, driven by low-cost manufacturing, to high quality of growth, driven by innovation. Enterprises today must pay workers higher salaries, which requires higher gross margins, which requires innovation in products and services. How to spur innovation, which comes almost entirely from the private sector. Here's the problem. Because China's financial system is skewed heavily to banks, and bank loans are skewed heavily to state-owned enterprises, private companies, small and medium-sized companies, face a financing deficit. How then to transform the financial system to support private companies? What can banks do differently? Is financial technology, fintech companies, the solution? What about shadow banking? And globally, how will transforming China's financial system affect international financial markets? We explore financial innovation and financial risk to be closer to China. The outbreak of COVID-19, the novel coronavirus at the beginning of 2020, has disrupted daily life and business in China. In Guangdong province, small and medium-sized enterprises restarted production on February 10th after an extended Chinese New Year holiday. What is actually happening? Body temperature checks, handing out gloves and masks. In Guangzhou, preventative measures are required for every company resuming operations. The green light is given. Yet, before turning on the machines, workers use disinfectants to clean the floor thoroughly. The return date has been postponed for 10 days and that will affect the delivery of about 20% of our products. We have to delay the delivery dates as well. It's a tiny factory with only a dozen workers. Most have come back, but some companies in Guangdong province face a shortage of labor due to some employees not returning and other constraints. It's a structural problem. Some workers in other cities are under quarantine and not able to come back while other workers are available, but their factories are still closed. Measures have been initiated by both the central and local governments to help companies and markets. So, how does COVID-19 impact China's economy and the world economy? I speak with Professor Bert Hoffman, former World Bank Country Director for China. How would you evaluate China's current economy? What's the impact of the novel coronavirus pneumonia, NCP, or COVID-19 on China's economy, both short-term and long-term? Clearly, the coronavirus has an impact. Um, we don't know how much yet, and it really depends on how long it's going to take, how deep it's going to go. For now, it already is going on quite a, quite a bit. Uh, there's a risk that it goes into the second quarter, and if you look at the potential impact, it, it may actually be bigger than, say, SARS. SARS had a very sharp decline in one quarter, the second quarter of 2003, uh, but then there was a very sharp rebound of the economy. This time, things may be a little different, uh, in part because it's bigger. The number of infections are far bigger than during SARS. Second, the economy has shifted more towards services. 
and it's harder to rebound in services. Once you didn't go to the cinema in one week, you're not going to go twice to catch up in the next week when there's no more coronavirus. So, so that ha means that the impact might potentially be bigger. For now, if you look at, uh, and there's a third factor, and that is really that in 2003, with SARS, uh, the economy was booming and roaring ahead. That's not the case now. Recently, China's Ministry of Finance has unveiled tax policies and financial relief measures to aid the economy during the epidemic. Equally important, the uh, People's Bank of China has worked to guarantee a sufficient liquidity and offer financial support. How do these policies help fight the pandemic and maintain financial stability? Well, these policies, I think, are very important. And, um, you know, under the assumption that it will be a fairly sharp decline and then a bounce back, it's key to protect the companies and it's key to protect the jobs because in a normal ongoing economy, they will still be needed. But they're facing a, a difficult time. Uh, the measures taken help there. Uh, the, the liquidity that the People's Bank has provided to banks allows the banks to extend uh, loans uh, or probably better not call in loans or wait a bit longer with loans. The central bank can also uh, uh, have what, what you call regulatory forbearance, i.e. It doesn't count against bad loans if you postpone asking for repayments. That's an important measure. Uh, the Ministry of Finance um, uh, is supporting companies at, at, at the time. Uh, the question is what would be going forward the best stimulus measure? Um, and it may be too early to tell, but my consideration would be as follows. Well, look, consumption has been fairly hard hit. Consumption is actually the future. So those measures that stimulate consumption are going to be more important than those measures that stimulate investment. As the epidemic continues in China, the world's second largest economy faces daunting challenges. Maintaining growth, securing jobs, financing companies, all are high priorities. How are foreign businesses being affected? In an industrial park on the outskirts of Shenzhen, piles of stock goods exemplify how industries are affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, for us, our major market is the end consumer. Uh, we deal with brokers, we do, we do B2B and B2C. Okay, so this is a significant part of all of our business here in China. And most of the market is focused on the China market. We don't do much export at all. For Canadian-Australian Stephen Budisa, who first came to China in 1989, his business depends on a brisk, fully functioning economy. Obviously, as of now, he is facing difficulties. We didn't anticipate this happening, so we didn't build up our inventory. We didn't plan to carry inventory. And so what's going to happen now is when we start getting orders, if they do come, we're going to be short on many of the products that we have in the warehouse. So if we place an order now with the vendor, most of them are saying, we don't have any workers here. That's a big concern for us. Budisa believes that costs of the epidemic will be felt across numerous industries and sectors, especially in China's integrated economy. But like so many other businesses across the country, putting health and safety first is the obvious priority. I think it's important to look after the people aspect, but at one turning point, there's got to be a turning point. Okay, when is our, when is our environment safe? And at that point, the government has to step in and say, hey, everyone come back to work. How will the coronavirus epidemic affect the global supply chain now centered in China? Will multinational corporations seek to diversify apparent risks of China now exacerbated by the virus? It's interesting, and it, and it, it all depends on how things are managed, frankly. Um, because it's a fact of life that, that there are a risk of epidemics and China has some additional risk for certain, certain uh, characteristics of China. But overall, companies have to deal with that. Um, diversification, of course, has its benefits, but it also has its expenses. So having two, two, two production sites instead of one is usually more expensive. So companies have to make their own trade-offs. The coronavirus comes at a point in time when a lot of com companies are already looking at either moving out of China or diversifying from China for 
a number of reasons. The first reason is China is moving up the value chain and China is actually becoming more expensive. So some of the more labor intensive goods are starting to move out of China. Second, uh, the coronavirus comes uh, in the wake of the US-China agreement, but a lot of the uh, uh, companies have concluded from the US-China tensions that they may want to have a bit more diversified supply chain so that uh, they won't suddenly be hit by a tariff on exports from China. So that, again, uh, I think people were not yet moving on that, but because the agreement was made, this was the time when companies started to move. So third now comes the coronavirus, and I think, I think the reaction of the authorities and the credibility of their policies towards this, this coronavirus is very important in, in, for companies to make a decision whether this is an additional reason to move out or not. Coming up next, the battle against the novel coronavirus is waged from hospitals to the real economy. How to achieve high quality growth in context of black swan events and gray rhino problems? I speak with Professor Huang Yi Ping, Deputy Dean, National School of Development, Peking University. We know that China's not the low cost producer anymore, that China has to have more uh, high quality growth. We hear terms like innovation society. So, mm. so what is it about China's economy that needs in innovation in order to affect transformation? Well, if you look uh, from the surface, you find the two things um, that is uh, happening after the global financial crisis. On the one hand, growth has been decelerating since 2020 when GDP growth was still above 10%. Uh, in 2019, we probably had a number slightly above 6%. Some people feel that the downward pressure is probably still here, although the government is trying to um, adopt some counter-cyclical measures. The second thing that is also important is that the productivity is also on the way down. Um, so for instance, one measure I always look at is called the incremental capital output ratio, which basically measures how many units of capital you need to produce one unit of GDP. The number was 3.5 in 2007, and now it's above 6, which means capital efficiency is also declining. Mm. If we combine these two things together, uh, you could argue that maybe we are entering a new phase of economic development. Whatever we've done in the past the successfully might not be able to continue, mm. and we needed to do things differently. That, I think, is why uh, we're looking, at, uh, looking for some new growth models. So what would be the uh, elements of such new growth models? Uh, the term innovation sounds very right. good, and it yes. was the first of uh, Xi Jinping's Buddha Fajan Linian, the five development concepts, but what does that mean in, in, in the real economy? In the past, um, the cost level is relatively low. Um, when China started the economic reform in 1978, its GDP per capita was 230 US dollars. Mm. That's below the World Bank's definition of a poverty line. Mm, right. But now the cost is so high, GDP per capita in 2019 was probably slightly above 10,000 US dollars. Yeah. That's high mid-income country. The cost level is very high. So this is why during the last 10 years we are seeing a lot of manufacturing companies falling apart because the cost just just increased so many times, you have to be successful, you have to do something new. And that is the reason why innovation becomes more important. Even prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus epidemic, China's economy was feeling pressures such as losing its low-cost advantage, its aging population, and growing resistance to globalization in some countries. In this context, how can China achieve high-quality growth? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the, the virus, the coronavirus outbreak hasn't really changed that, but it did highlight one thing that um, has been on the agenda in China for quite a while, but especially since the 19th Party Congress, and that, that's governance. Um, I mean, there's many elements that go into, into, into a more productive, more innovation-driven 
economy and it, it includes it enterprise reforms, financial sector reforms, it includes uh, 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 better intellectual property rights, it includes uh, 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 world-class universities, better education, that uh, primary and secondary education that, that, that brings people up to speed for those world-class universities, all of that. What difficulties do private and micro enterprises face in their development? Yeah, so one of the big ones is access to finance. And, and this is true everywhere, so China's not that different. If you look at the lending from the banks, tends to go to big state enterprises. If you add, talk to the banks, they'll say, well, big state enterprise is a safe client. You know, they you start lending to some very small private firm that has an idea. You know, you're taking a bet on whether that's a good idea or not. It turns out to be a bad idea. The firm goes bankrupt and the, and the bank essentially loses the money that it lent. So you always have this challenge. Uh, a couple ways to get around it. And there are things you can do on the regulatory front to really encourage banks to lend to small and medium firms. Uh, you now have that new stock market that's aimed at uh, the high-tech firms in China. Some of those are very big, of course, but that's an opportunity for some small firms to come in. So, so letting the stock market uh, be open to some of these small firms as they succeed, developing what we call venture capital. The challenge here is that the banks usually assess the credit risks by looking at one of the three things. Either you have a very complete set of historical data, mm -hmm. or you have fixed assets right. which can be served as collaterals, and or, or if you have some implicit guarantee for them from the government, then the banks are willing to lend you money. Unfortunately, all three of those small companies don't have. The small <laughs> SMEs and the private enterprises don't have any of these. That is why, so I don't blame the banks per se, no, of course that not. they can't extend the loans to these SMEs because for banks, banks um, in order for them to extend the loans, they, you need to control risks. You can't just recklessly sure. extend the loans. Yeah, and they have pressure today because the financial risk is True. one of the, the three True. big battles that Xi Jinping talked about. And so they're under pressure to, to reduce their risk and, and right. non-performing loans, etc. So they're, they're really given contradictory kinds mm. of uh, uh, objectives. On the one hand, support innovation. Right. On the other hand, reduce your financial risk. True. <laughs> True. Well, that's right. Um, so on the one hand, financial institutions need to find a ways to assess credit risks mm. of this new group of yeah. companies yeah. which are vital for innovation-driven growth. The second problem we're also facing now is interest rate is not entirely market-based. And so the banks actually face difficulties in lending to the SMEs if they can't substantially, significantly raise the lending rates. Yes, of course. Um, so I think that we need to change on both fronts. Number one, to find effective ways for the banks in dealing with the risks of the small, medium companies. And number two, we also need to push through well, really the last steps of interest rate liberalization. Mm. Despite the growth of China's private sector, challenges remain, primarily financing. In 2015, Alibaba and its affiliate, Ant Financial, launched MyBank, a new online bank. MyBank, offering loans, is dedicated to providing inclusive and innovative financial solutions for individuals and for small and micro enterprises in both urban and rural areas. Mr. Yang from Zhejiang province ran an online shop on Taobao selling sweet potatoes. In 2015, two years after starting his business, he borrowed a total of over 600,000 yuan from my bank, which helped address the financing of his business. At a traditional bank, it takes at least one month to get a loan. There are verification and guarantee requirements. At my bank, the funds may come into the account one minute after submitting the online application. Based on big data and cloud computing, my bank has provided microloans totaling over 2 trillion yuan, that's 290 billion US dollars, to over 15 million small and micro enterprises and entrepreneurs in China by June 2019. 
What benefits would financial innovation and transformation bring to private enterprises, small and micro enterprises? Actually, that's a great question because you already see a lot of this in China. Mm -hmm. You know, China's had a lot of fintech development, so you've got people paying for things on their phones now, and they're, they're leapfrogging credit cards in many ways. You, know, you can go on y y your phone to these, uh, these essentially online banks, uh, and you can get loans and you can make deposits, all of that, you know, that's very helpful. So for small and medium firms, I think these fintech developments create opportunities to borrow money and to make payments in a very efficient way. Big data online, online big data. So you don't have a fixed asset, you don't have a historical, historical data, but if, I know, if you have enough digital footprints, I can try to assess your risk and trying to make a, make, make a loan. And so we have, at the moment, we have three online banks, these new kind of banks. Um, the, uh, the, the My Bank in uh, Hangzhou mm -hmm. is affiliated to the N Financial. The, the We Bank um, in uh, Shenzhen affiliated to Tencent. And there's another new bank in uh, Chengdu called the XW Bank, mm -hmm. affiliated to um, the New Hope company and uh, Xiaomi. Um, all three, are, three online banks do business slightly differently, but the, 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 the central piece of risk assessment is the same. Basically, look at your digital footprint um, and extend the loans directly online. And nowadays, each of these three banks has something like between 1,000 to 2,000 staff in their single mm. office, headquarter office, mm. because it's an online bank. Yeah. They only have one office. But each of them is extending more than 10 million loans today, wow. mm -hmm. every year, mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. What impact will the reform and transformation of China's financial system have on the internationalization of China's currency, the RMB? I, uh, I think this financial reform in China is really the foundation of internationalization of the RMB. You know, the government started promoting international of the RMB a number of years ago, and it, it seemed to be taking off very quickly. You know, the China's share of global payments that are in RMB increased very quickly, but starting very close to zero, it went from about zero to about two percent of world transactions very quickly. But it's stagnated over the last five years or so. And I think you know, the world is basically looking at China to see more thorough reform of the financial system. Again, I think this is pretty simple. And the solution is to gradually uh, open up so that money can move in more easily. Well, I think it will rise quite significantly. Um, but obviously, we'll still have significant hurdles to overcome for RMB to play a much, much more uh, a prominent role in the international market. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the exchange rates need to be a lot more flexible. The, um, the capital markets need to be a lot more open. But there are also a lot of many questions about our legal system, our information, the, the free flow of mm -hmm. information, and so on. These are all very important for um, the, 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 the financial decision. So, so I think it will on the way, uh, rise, but I would not, uh, um, in, the, in the perceivable future, uh, predict a significant role. For China to achieve its overarching goal for China 2049, what are the primary challenges for China's financial system? 
Right. So I think that uh, that's a big question. Yeah, I think one of the first challenges is to avoid having a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, financial reform is difficult. Financial opening is difficult. I've never encouraged China to just move ahead blindly with opening up its whole financial system because there are risks. So managing things so there's no banking crisis in China, I think that's the number one priority because that would have a devastating effect on China and the rest of the world. Mm. The first thing you find is uh, uh, policy coordination is relatively weak. Um, different uh, um, institutions lo uh, responsible for different areas, but the, the, the exchange of information and the coordination of policy is relatively weak. This is why we didn't have a good regulation on shadow banking. Mm -hmm. And uh, stock investors borrowing from the banks uh, sometimes not everybody uh, was aware of it. So these things need to change. But fortunately now we have a State Council Financial Stability Development uh, Commission. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have, uh, there is a significant, important need to upgrade our regulatory capability. Right. But looking back at the reason why we didn't have any systemic financial crisis, was because of mainly two reasons. Number one was sustained rapid economic growth. When the economy mm. is expanding so rapidly for all so long, all problems yeah, can right. be absorbed. Right, right. The second reason was because of the implicit government guarantee. The reason why recently we are seeing more risks now is because both of these factors are gradually weakening. Growth is slowing down. The government can't guarantee everything. And so I think the risks start to rise. But the, the regulators, I think they need to improve their capability significantly. Mm. The stock market, as you probably know, um, we've been doing it for almost 30 years. And I must say the quality of the capital markets is really not up to standard. China must transform its financial system and markets to support innovation in the real economy which is essential for China's continuing economic development. Key is innovation in finance. New financial institutions are essential, leveraging China's state-of-the-art e-commerce. How to encourage innovation while mitigating risks may require a new breed of regulators. While China will continue to develop its financial system, it is unrealistic to expect U.S. or U.K. markets overnight. Banks will continue to be the major source of financing enterprises, but if banks can adopt big data methods, they can modernize their analysis of credit worthiness, especially of small and medium-sized companies which generate innovation. FinTech institutions exemplify data-driven, inclusive finance. Critical is China's unprecedented commitment to open up its finance industry to foreign companies, encouraging competition to improve customer service. Trends are clear. China Finance will continue to integrate into world markets and continue to promote RMB internationalization. But forecasting 2049 by projecting 2020, that's risky business. One must be ever vigilant to be closer to China.